When people think of a million dollar car, they can't help but consider the Duesenberg among them. In its day, it was the most powerful car on the road. In fact, it was said that a Duesenberg owner was passed only when they wished to be passed. The car was such a better performer than anything else on the road. Introduced late in 1928, you've got a car with a 420 cubic inch engine that delivers 265 horsepower when its next closest American competitor, the Chrysler Imperial, delivered only 130. So we're talking more than double the horsepower rating of its closest domestic competitor. And what you got was, was not just horsepower, it's the way you got your horsepower. The Duesenberg brothers, Fred and August, um, were, were very much into racing. Um, they raced in Indianapolis. They were very successful. They, they, they knew what they were talking about when they came down to engineering. So when E.L. Cord approached them about building the ideal car for the ultra high end of the market, uh, this is what they came up with. It's essentially a Grand Prix car, but scaled up to heroic proportions and fitted with some of the most beautiful coachwork ever built. This car, as it happens, was fitted with a uh, body by Murphy of Pasadena. Now, every Duesenberg, every Model J Duesenberg built um, was delivered from the factory as a chassis only. Then you had to send it to a coach builder or have it sent to a coach builder for the body to be built. In other words, what you bought from Duesenberg were the frame rails, the wheels and axles, the engine, the steering wheel that came up. If you strapped an orange crate to it and sat down, you could theoretically drive it. Um, the factory price of a chassis in uh, 1929 was $7,500, uh, went up quickly to $8,500 within a couple of years. And the cheapest body you could buy ran about $4,500 to $5,000. So we're talking about $13,000 out the door when people made, uh, on average during the year, a few hundred dollars. Uh, over a 12 month period of time. In other words, you're looking at a car that was just incredibly expensive. And that's one of the things that distinguishes a million dollar car. The other things that help distinguish a million dollar car are its high quality, uh, its high style, its high performance, and its very, very low production. In the grand scheme of things, uh, only about 500 or so Duesenbergs uh, were ever built over a span of a few years, um, they were introduced in late 1928 as a 1929 model, and the last one was delivered as a new car uh, in, we believe, 1937. Um, by that time, the, the height of the engine uh, and the, uh, the engineering did not lend itself um, so well to road-going cars, and, and Duesenberg collapsed um, with the Cord Corporation in, in about 19... Uh, the late 1930s, Auburn, Cord, and Duesenberg, they all went away at about the same time. Um, but, but this car is one of the supercharged versions. Um, to get even more power from the double overhead cam, four valve per cylinder, a mostly aluminum engine, uh, they added a supercharger, and it's a trifical supercharger that was driven from a stock from the side of the engine. It was a, an, an impeller that was driven mechanically and forced the fuel in the air mixture into the cylinders for greater performance, a greater explosion, a, a more a powerful um, uh, explosion in the, in the, uh, um, the cylinders. Uh, and that elevated the horsepower rating from 265 to 320. Later on, they revised the manifolding, uh, added another carburetor, and they ended up with 400 horsepower. Another attribute about the Duesenberg that makes it worth so much money, the Model J Duesenberg, is the fact that you, if you wanted, you could drive it around today. It has modern performance. Uh, and everything between your hands and the, and the road is in either ball or roller bearings. So this car is incredibly well engineered. It's comparatively easy to drive for a car that weighs more than two tons uh, at its lightest. Uh, some of these cars ended up uh, weighing more than three tons. In fact, one car built from the, for a fellow by the name of Father Divine out of New York um, was so heavy that it would snap the spokes of the rear wheels. That's how much it weighed. Um, 
this car, it has a very large steering wheel before the era of power steering so that you could get the leverage that you needed when you were going around a corner. But the one thing that it did have also was power brakes. Uh, the brakes, the faster you went, the more power that you had at your disposal uh, to stop the car, which is very important uh, when you were driving a car that could go 120 miles an hour. Um, it was not something to, to leap to chance. Now, when you ordered your Duesenberg convertible coupe from Murphy, you had a lot of decisions to make. One of them was whether you wanted your door hinged at the front or the back. Uh, one of them, whether you wanted your top to stack behind the passenger compartment or conceal beneath a metal panel as this one does. Uh, you could also choose the length of wheelbase. Uh, if you wanted a little bit more wheelbase, even though it was a two-seat car to make it more comfortable, you could do that. You could specify a trunk or a rumble seat. This car happens to have a rumble seat. And you access it from the sidewalk side of the vehicle. It's a left-hand drive, which is uh, American um, configuration. You pull up to the sidewalk. Um, you get your very nimble passenger to climb on the running board, take a step here, another step here, and climb into the rumble seat. And since this car has a rumble seat and the driver, the owner, may have wished to travel, they installed a trunk rack for a trunk. And that's where we get the name today for a trunk. It's exactly um, what, what it was intended to be, something removable with handles on it that your valet or, or the, um, your chauffeur could take off and unpack in your hotel room or, or your uh, destination of choice.